uh, and that was on top of the other Africa trips she did with, uh, you know, with the uh, the Aaron Bauer Todd Jackman labs. So um, after leaving, after she just got her PhD in 2021, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, she's been on the talk circuit, like winning awards and such, which is pretty great. And um, and uh, now she's a postdoc uh, at the, I actually don't know that university in Alberta, the University of Lethbridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, and where she's working on salamanders and snakes. And I guess we're gonna get to hear a little bit about that. That part of yeah. her, her, of her, uh, her record is not on the CV, so I'm, I'm anxious to hear about it. Uh, but today, the main event is going to be uh, her work on on snakes uh, in in Madagascar. So, Ariana, uh, take it away. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm just going to quick share my screen here. Um, look good. Okay. Yeah. So, um, just to get started here. One. So yeah, thank you for the introduction. And you know, I hope one day uh, all the stars will align and I'll actually get to attend a herpetology seminar series in person with all of you. But for now, I'm really excited that I have this chance to share my research with the Berkeley community all the way here from Canada. So since I'm newly relocated today, I'm mostly talking to, about my doctoral research that was conducted at the American Museum uh, in New York City. So this sits on unceded indigenous land, uh, specifically the homeland of the Lenape peoples. So before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the Lenape community and pay my respects to their past, present, and future peoples. And uh, I'm hoping to have a little bit of time at the end to share about my new projects that I've got going on at the University of Lethbridge, because I've kind of made a transition from snakes to salamanders, and I'm really excited about it. But it's, it's not permanent. It's just it's part of the bigger picture. <laughs> um, so yeah. Next slide. Yeah, so the, the questions I'm going to be talking about today really are something that I've always been interested in, even since I was a little kid. And these questions are about how organisms exist in and interact with their natural environments. So how these types of interactions can tell us more about why they're there or, or why they're not there. So these questions have evolved since the 90s, but the underlying ideas are still the same. As biologists, can we explain the causal mechanisms that have generated patterns of biodiversity that we're seeing in our world today? So to simplify this, what I really wanna know is why is it that when I go to see my family in Southeast Pennsylvania, I go on a bike ride, I catch a milk snake, I can catch a big awesome rat snake, but I don't catch any other species. How did certain organisms get to where they are now and what external factors such as their current environment, historical events or intrinsic factors such as their physiologies or life histories cause these organisms to originate, to kind of differentiate from other organisms and then persist through challenging conditions. And when we zoom out further from this, how did entire communities of snakes and frogs and lizards come to share these same habitats? And are there any shared events or traits that can kind of relate these assemblage patterns together? And given these questions, ultimately what I wanna know is if I can use this information to model and predict how these species will fare under future climate change um, in their native habitat. So as I mentioned, I'm currently speaking to you from Southwest Alberta, where I've just started a postdoctoral fellowship in the Lee lab at the University of Lethbridge. And for this talk, I'll actually be taking you from Western Canada back to the location of my doctoral studies on the East Coast in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History. But to address these questions about how biodiversity accumulates, I'll actually be taking us entirely out of North America to the Southern Hemisphere, across the Mozambique Channel, to this closed natural laboratory that has been isolated from continental landmasses for nearly 80 million years. And this landmass is the island of Madagascar. So these are interesting questions about evolution and diversity to ask anywhere on Earth. Um, but when we examine them in the context of a closed system that's just teeming with diversity, and massive in situ radiations and some of the highest family level endemism of any place on earth, we can really hammer down an understanding of how biological diversity originates and what drives and maintains patterns of richness. So places like Madagascar, but sort of deciphering the processes that have actually then generated Madagascar's endemic diversity sort of requires a deeper understanding of historic events and will be important in predicting how species are gonna respond in the future. So, I will note, in addition to this long-term isolation that makes this kind of an ideal system, Madagascar also has these super sharp environmental gradients ranging from ecoregions such as the coastal lowland and high elevation rainforests that the island is, is really well known for. And here I have a picture of an example of that habitat and probably one of the coolest snake species from that region, which is Liophidium pitoni, which is like this rainbow snake from Madagascar, which I really love. 
Um, two other unique landscape features like the karst limestone formations with highly special, specialized microendemic constituents, kind of like this Paradura Homolorina, um, as well as other arid ecoregions such as the high elevation central plateau with its mosaic of grassland and isolated deciduous forest pockets. Um, and because these habitats have been isolated a really long time, these ecotones are sort of contained in this compact space um, that isn't influenced by migration in and out of the island. Um, so this system is really perfect for studies that are examining diversification and biodiversity gradients. And one of the things I wanted to know about Madagascar was if discrete but major events in the biogeographic history of the island could at least in part explain these patterns across whole groups of interacting species. So um, I will now tell you that I focused on answering these questions using reptiles and amphibians as my focal system because they comprise the largest terrestrial vertebrate mass on the island. Uh, these groups are almost entirely endemic. These organisms have been shown to respond strongly to ecological gradients. And although microendemism is really high on Madagascar, many herp lineages have high genetic diversity. Uh, they maintain these broad distributions, often spanning multiple biomes and ecoregions, as I mentioned earlier. And so these groups should yield many independently evolving populations with divergence and diversity patterns that are reflective of historical processes. So I will now be completely honest with you, in addition to all of the reasons I sort of just outlined, I first chose to focus on herps before all of these reasons became clear to me because things like the Europlatus pictured here, Paradura, tiny pink Persifer viridis, these are some of my favorite herp species on earth. So I really jumped at the chance to think about all of them at the same time to understand what events drove island-wide patterns of population dynamics. So as I mentioned in the introduction, Madagascar is this iconic biodiversity hotspot, but we still know very little about what landscape or historical features are responsible for driving patterns of diversification on the island, um, especially those that have generated these unique patterns of endemism and species richness that the island's sort of famous for. So the approach that I took to understanding the role of historical climate in shaping these patterns we see on Madagascar was at the assemblage level. So what I wanted to know was, do populations respond to the same events in the same way? And do these size change events across vertebrate communities coincide with known periods of historical climatic turnover? So we know that globally climate was very unstable throughout the late quaternary or um, the historical period that spanned the last uh, 2.6 million years. And in this graph, we can see that as time progresses from the past at the left, um, to present day on the right, global climate kind of peaks at several discrete time periods. And in between these periods, we have glacial periods where the temperature um, and precipitation drop and overall things became very arid um, in some habitats and very unfavorable for many species. So many sh studies have shown that these climatic changes are strongly correlated with significant vegetative shifts. And we can kind of expect that species that are subjected to these changing conditions will also respond strongly to these vegetative shifts. Um, and here we're kind of looking at changes in climate at the bottom and above we have changes in population size um, following those changes in climate. So our expectations are that when conditions change and they become unfavorable, such as during one of these interglacial periods, uh, a species may contract or reduce in size and then during warmer or wetter periods that species may likewise expand as suitable habitat also expands and the signal of these responses can be recovered from the organism's genome. So these glacial cycles of the quaternary are sort of the paradigm for explaining diversity across a lot of uh, biomes globally. Um, and because these patterns can generate opportunities for speciation events, um, we don't necessarily know if these events invoked to explain these patterns are actually um, causally related to patterns of endemism and richness. So we do know that in Madagascar, just like the rest of the world, climate has not been historically stable. And you can see within the last 10 million years, conditions have become much warmer overall in Madagascar, that precipitation and seasonality in some regions like the rainforest have drastically increased, whereas in other regions like the spiny desert in the south, they've become much drier. So previous investigations of single populations have identified plioplacocene climate change in the late quaternary as an important driver for demographic change in some individualistic species. But what we want to know beyond just these individual species level responses is if these climate change events were so significant that many species were responding in the same way to the same events. And therefore we can then invoke these processes as being really important to shaping the biodiversity that we see on Madagascar. So I also looked into how independent biogeographic histories of certain ecoregions may have played a role in driving these responses, right? Because we know that um, across Madagascar, these ecoregions are not ubiquitous. And so um, 
in the two kind of darkest patches on the right, these dark green patches, these are our more humid ecoregions, and those on the left are much more arid. So I had expectations going into this that the timing and landscape features of these regions were potentially going to dictate different assemblage-wide responses rather than everything across the entire island being exactly the same. Likewise, even within these discrete ecoregions, organisms can occupy a wide range of elevational gradients. And this is really important for understanding how species traits and tolerance to wider or more restricted set of ecological conditions would also impact their response. And then my expectations about how uh, important these, these changes would be to shaping the biodiversity on the island. So for example, a generalist species like this Heterolyxalis bacilio on the bottom right-hand corner can be found at really high elevations, but also low elevations across a pretty large range. Whereas Madagascar is low, which was recently described by my colleagues in the upper left hand corner is only found in Ankarana at much higher elevations so it's an extreme endemic, um, extreme endemic species. So in addition to these external conditions and climate and ecological gradients, species traits are also going to influence their, their response to these historical climate events. So for example, these are both geckos. Uh, they both share some basic characteristics. For example, they're both nocturnal, but the baby paradura is a terrestrial species and the Europlatus on the right is only going to be found in the trees. So these types of, of differences influence how vegetative shifts or changes in precipitation um, can interact with population level responses. Likewise, when we look at organisms from entirely different families, like amphibians and reptiles, we know that things like climate and precipitation and dispersal capabilities are going to also impact their response, no matter how strong the climatic changes of the quaternary might have been across the entire island or across their entire shared biome. So what I wanted to know was, have there been community-wide responses to the same historical events or landscape features that have driven these patterns of richness and endemism? Or have all these lineages, like some of the examples I've pictured here on the island, have completely individualistic evolutionary trajectories due to the factors I kind of just outlined here, eco-region distribution, um, intrinsic traits, or biogeographic histories of their, their um, eco-regions. And you know, we know in North America and in the Kanchigan era biome in Brazil, for example, um, really strong climatic changes in the Pleistocene actually influence species across the entire community to have um, shared population demographic responses, despite the fact that some of these species had really different biogeographic histories and really different um, intrinsic traits. So this is a simplified schematic of the models that I use to address these hypotheses about the impact of quaternary climate change. So just kind of to orient you, we have time moving from the past at the bottom to the present at the top. We have these independent pipes representing independent populations. So in, in this case, we can assume my entire assemblage is comprised of four populations, but really I examined many more than that. And if our hypotheses about quaternary climate change were correct, um, I expected to see a high proportion of populations within the assemblage either expanding or contracting at, at the same time, and that this co-expansion or co-contraction event actually coincides with climatic shifts during this period. So alternatively, if we don't detect these shared population size change events, and instead we detect kind of partial or completely asynchronous demographic change, um, we expect assemblage-wide responses and environmental fluctuations to not temporarily be coinciding. And in this scenario, there's, there's several possible explanations for why we might not see asynchronous expansion. So population responses could be delayed, they could be altered due to biotic interactions or differences in life history, kind of like I outlined earlier, or the populations could be experiencing completely different biogeographic histories or responding to different events. So I tested these models of the co-expansion using uh, genomic data and approximate Bayesian computation um, to, to kind of estimate parameters of interest across 64 different populations of reptiles and amphibians on Madagascar as well as several different subsets that address my different hypotheses about um, endemism within bio, um, biogeographic regions or shared uh, traits across species groups. And, um, you know, we found that expansion histories for these groups were highly asynchronous across the entire island and within a lot of these different biomes and within uh, specific taxonomic groups, so like amphibians versus reptiles. Um, they occurred at very different time periods due to differences in their life histories and their distributions. Um, however, when we examined populations that were entirely endemic to the humid eastern rainforest, so that kind of dark patch on the on the right side of the island, um, we found highly synchronous expansion histories with more than half of all populations co-expanding around 100,000 years ago, just after the last interglacial, 
And we also identified that amphibians with wider elevational ranges were most likely to have experienced population expansion events. So this highlights the importance of these humid regions uh, as they have acted as these important refugial zones for forest adapted taxa. And these humid corridors connecting suitable habitat across these different elevational gradients um, during unfavorable, pe unfavorable periods in the past ultimately played a huge role in conserving genetic and species level diversity on the entire island. Um, and this is really important because the humid eastern rainforests are also the most at-risk habitat on the entire island. And we already know that about 8% of intact forests remains on Madagascar right now, probably less than that because, you know, this estimate is from a, a study in 2015. Um, but we're currently facing similar climate change threats without these humid forest rain corridors to preserve this contemporary genetic diversity in the future like they did in the past. So this kind of just really reinforces the importance of these different habitats within an already threatened kind of entire eco region. So moving forward from here, I really wanted to dig a little bit further into what extrinsic ecological factors and intrinsic species traits kind of influence these assemblage wide responses. And to do that, I turn to one of my favorite vertebrate groups on Earth, the Malagasy gem snakes. So this group has over 100 species and boasts incredible ecological and morphological diversity. And uh, I have just a few favorites pictured here, but there are many more cool species in this group. And with great effort, we were able to collect population level genome wide sampling for the majority of common species groups in the subfamily. And this was really cool. First off, because with this assemblage level focus, I was able to generate genome wide data sets, which had greater power to detect other demographic events such as population bottlenecks. Um, the second reason this was really awesome because it meant that I got to go to Madagascar and collect more genetic data to fill in a lot of these sampling gaps that we had. Uh, and that's my favorite thing to do on Earth. So I should note to generate population genomic data for over 12 different species groups was a lot of work. And it was certainly not just me that did this. Um, there were many amazing people on our team that did so much work to make this happen. You know, snake phylogeography is a team effort for sure. And uh, I want to specifically acknowledge the team members on this slide who spent a lot of time helping me catch snakes in the field and, uh, you know, surviving <laughs> different, different conditions in the field together and also uh, catching snakes for this project when I wasn't around. So I'm kind of indebted to them for that. And with this zoomed in focus on a single subfamily of snakes with both narrow and wise fed population distributions and this kind of much more extensive genomic sampling, I was able to ask again, how synchronous were demographic events across assemblages, but also um, I was able to test for synchronicity in bottleneck events along with synchronous expansion events. So just like in my previous study, we first examined this genome-wide sampling for 12 different species complexes to tease apart population structure, which could confound our ability to detect these bottleneck and expansion events in the first place, and also allowed us to identify units for downstream analyses. So we used several different approaches from summary statistics to single population simulation studies to identify these populations and those that had recently expanded versus those that had recently experienced a population bottleneck event. And um, this resulted in 12, um, 12 uh, species, 12 populations that exp experienced a recent bottleneck, as well as 21 that had experienced a uh, recent expansion. And then from here, along with collaborators, I've recently started working on a Python program for performing a phylogeographic temporal analyses, which uses genome-wide or whole genome data samples from co-distributed taxa to perform historical demographic inference. So uh, really briefly, this is sort of just done by generating simulations under demographic models, training a machine learning framework in a supervised fashion, and then kind of using this to uh, map between simulated data and model parameter values to predict intervals for the, the parameters that will tell us about the degree of synchronicity in the expansion event or the contraction event, as well as the timing of these shared demographic events. So using PTA, we found that assemblage-wide bottleneck events for gem snakes were highly synchronous, with nearly all population contraction occurring in a single pulse around 120,000 years ago. Uh, this is really significant because myself and collaborators previously found that overall rates of speciation for gem snakes uh, were highest throughout the Miocene and actually show this sort of significant decrease in the Pleistocene right around the time that we were detecting all of these events. So, when we look at this graph on the left of the distribution of pairwise divergence states for the 38 new gem snake species we recently identified in blue and previously described species in pink, um, for previously described species, we found that almost 90% of speciation events for newly discovered species actually occurred in the Pleistocene. 
So these results coupled with my findings kind of suggest that not only was most of the standing extant diversity in this group likely generated during the Pleistocene, but that Pleistocene shifts in habitat may have in fact accelerated speciation. And the decrease that we were seeing in those rates is probably due to other factors such as interspecific competition as niche space became saturated. So we also recovered a high degree of synchronicity in assemblage-wide bottlenecks with about 0.7 of all taxa simultaneously contracting around 45,000 years ago. So considering the precise prediction intervals we obtained for this estimate, this shared bottleneck event was inferred to have occurred well before the onset of the Holocene and also prior to the period of the last glacial maximum. Um, this is really important because the loss of endemic megafauna on Madagascar, so things like enormous elephant birds, giant tortoises, massive lemurs. This is continuously debated in the literature. I think I just saw another paper published, you know, not about a month ago, uh, still kind of bringing up the debate from the other side um, as to what caused these ma massive uh, megafauna extinctions. So, you know, anthropogenic causes are certainly invoked, but recent evidence indicates that these species actually experienced several stretches of extremely unfavorable conditions over the last 8,000 years. So human arrival on islands is almost always led to dramatic loss of biodiversity, but some evidence suggests that the collapse on Madagascar was due to climatic stress coupled with this increased human activity during a very prominent drying period. So here in these snake taxa, we see many populations on Madagascar are likely vulnerable to uh, future climate change in a similar way that they were in the past, um, that a lot of this megafauna also was in the past. So it's kind of this, this kind of double acts of experiencing already a population bottleneck, unfavorable conditions, and then you add in the anthropogenic um, kind of salt on top, and that's really can be, uh, can be the end for a lot of distinct species. Um, so we now have high coverage whole genome sequences for several gem snake species, as well as a lot of low coverage genomes for nearly a thousand, or sorry, a thousand, a hundred, a hundred species in this subfamily. And together with collaborators at the AIM and H, we're going to be looking at how differences in life history traits that drive endemism and generalist distributions contribute to historical demographic dynamics. So our software PTA is kind of unique that it can fully account for recombination and linkage structure within simulated regions across whole genome data sets. So I'll use this to examine shared demographic responses across gem state communities to kind of understand how these pulses of expansion and contraction have contributed to community turnover and ultimately maybe stability on Madagascar. So I just have to pause here for a moment because uh, this actually blows my mind sometimes because we've taken this sort of something I would call a somewhat unknown subfamily of snakes. You know, they're not really the first one you think of when you think of a really diverse group of snakes that exists on planet Earth um, from this remote island in the tropics. And in a very short amount of time, we've generated a study system that will have more genomic resources than some of the snakes right in our own backyards. Um, and just to like kind of give an example of that, I have two individuals of the same species of leaf nose snake here. These are Langaha madagascariensis. Um, this is a sexually dimorphic species of snake. So there's a male on the left and a female on the right. And um, they're very captivating in terms of having this bizarre morphology. And yet to this day, despite the fact that we have high coverage 60X whole genome for Langaha madagascariensis, we still don't know exactly what the ecological function is of their nasal appendages um, or why males and females have this explicit sexual dimorphism. So, you know, we're still behind on many things with pseudoxyrophians, but I think we do have a lot in terms of their genomes and that, that kind of paves the way for future exploration of some of these cool traits. So I've kind of shown you that demographic events can be shared across entire assemblages, that these shared demographic shifts are largely driven by changes in quaternary climate, especially in the late Pleistocene, um, and that demographic processes related to population size change can ultimately be positive and lead to the formation of new species, or they can increase population vulnerability and lead to extinction and the loss of biodiversity. So this can happen again and again throughout the span of a species existent, and almost all species trajectories will end with massive bottlenecks resulting in a loss of genetic diversity such that the species cannot recover and ultimately goes extinct. But alternatively, we may see an increase in population size and diversity where intraspecific populations differentiated and form new species. So therefore, as these sort of demographic events feed into processes of speciation, extinction, and community assembly, they will in turn also shape patterns of biodiversity, such as species richness and endemism. 
so I hope I've convinced you today that by integrating ecological and genomic data across these diverse taxonomic groups, we can kind of move forward to identify things like at-risk hotspots, at-risk populations, and kind of create new predictions of how these patterns will shift under future climate change. Um, so, you know, now that we have this big picture of what whole gem snake assemblages on the island were doing and what whole herp communities on the island were doing, I had a few or were really many <laughs> remaining questions. And these all pertain to how landscape features, historical climate, and ecological gradients um, actually also influence population diversification and dynamics. So kind of moving in at a much more local scale, um, I zoomed in on some of my favorite species on the island that had these really, really dense sampling distributions across all these different habitats to ask these types of questions um, at a much more fine scale level. So I'm just gonna take a quick moment because this is her group to just introduce these different species um, <laughs> that I don't usually get to do in my other talks. And the first one that I was focusing on is one of my favorite species. Um, you know, Frank will always refer to this as a trash snake because they're everywhere, but I think that that makes them really cool that they're able to survive in all these different habitats. So this is the Malagasy cat-eyed snake uh, found just about everywhere from streams to rocky outcrops to trees, has this really beautiful polymorphic coloration that has absolutely no phylogenetic signal as far as we know, solid gold, silver, nearly black with blotches, sometimes golden. So I love this snake, um, have a ton of samples from them, which is why another reason why I love them. This is the Malagasy giant hognose. So it's kind of like this giant heterodon that also feigns death as a juvenile and sometimes has been seen digging up lizard eggs for food using that upturned snout, but it's, you know, it's completely unrelated taxonomically, um, completely convergent evolution there. Uh, Dromicodryas bernierii and quadrilineatus are almost like Malagasy whip snakes. Uh, they fill a really similar morphological niche space on the island of Madagascar a really a common species that you'll find kind of hanging out uh, even in kind of degraded habitats. And lastly, this is Madagascar's um, big-eyed snake and sometimes even called the Subid snake because it sort of freezes in place when it's detected, but it's actually really quite agile. And, you know, I found from taking lots of pictures with them that they don't like taking selfies, um, even though this is usually a really docile species. So focusing on these groups, they have sampling throughout the entire island. They're found in almost every single habitat. I then wanted to know, you know, do these ecological gradients, do these breaks across space actually influence how these species diverged over time? So in order to generate models of how populations diverge and estimate parameters that tell us about this divergence, uh, we needed several a priori estimates for, to, you know, to best construct these models and set reasonable prior values for simulations. So I first examined migration services across Madagascar. You know, we have expectations that species are not only different genetically because they're geographically far apart, but also um, genetically different because of different barriers across this space. So, um, you know, this is known as IBD. So the first thing I did was estimate departure from the signal. Um, and this is kind of a figure that, that graphically displays that where um, higher than expected migration rates are blue. These are sort of corridor areas on the island and regions that are um, orange are sort of these areas of lower migration rates or, you know, can be viewed as potential barriers to gene flow that promote speciation. So when I looked at this across all these four different species groups, I found some you know, coinciding patterns across their, their areas where they had these low migration surfaces. But also what, one thing that kind of stands out to me is that there's a lot of differentiation across these snake species, despite the fact that they all share really similar distributions. Um, and then kind of <laughs> fast forwarding much forward uh, to skip over a lot of the methods using genome-wide sampling for these snakes. I found that using different uh, machine learning algorithms and a simulation regression-based approach to estimate parameters of interest and perform model selection among many different putative models of divergence, that uh, estimates of divergence time for most of the recent diversification events uh, all occurred from the mid to late Pleistocene, when overall rates in speciation we already mentioned earlier declined across Madagascar's snake species. Um, and these were coupled with really low migration rates for the most recent species level splits. So evidence of historical gene flow was also present in some of the lineages, but uh, speciation with little gene flow has kind of become a common finding among dispersal limited organisms with parapatric and sympatric distributions. So, you know, moving forward from here, identifying this fact that many of them were diverging around the same time period, um, but there was, a, you know, not a strong signal of gene flow. I then wanted to know more about how the dramatic ecographic and elevational surfaces of Madagascar may have contributed to this rapid diversification. 
So to do this, we use spatial predictors of genetic diversity, differentiation, and structure while accounting for geographic distances to better understand how landscape features, refugia, and climate influence population differentiation. And this predictor set included surfaces that represented things like historical stability over time, um, all the way from the LGM to present day, rivers, elevation, uh, ecoregions, regions that have been identified as discrete uh, kind of regions of endemism based on watersheds, as well as several other that match pre-existing hypotheses about how species diverged on Madagascar. And we found that specifically ecological gradients were very important, but equally important was how stable the environment was in the past to present day. So these, these kind of areas where things have remained stable over time were really important for influencing diversification patterns. And we also found that previous hypotheses about watersheds, rivers, um, these have been used to explain uh, divergence events in lemurs, and they were you know, really appropriate for the species and then have been continuously invoked for other organisms on the island. And we find that for snakes, they are not important. Um, and it's possible that we should be considering in the future that maybe this isn't really a great fit for other small terrestrial species that are uh, dispersal limited as well. So in light of these results, I also was able to confirm that all these different species groups that I mentioned earlier, the, the Malagasy cat-eyed snake, uh, Dromica dryas, and the giant hognose, all um, included individuals that were kind of these cryptic species groups. So we have a couple of new species to describe that are very common on Madagascar, which I'm really excited about. And so my findings not only demonstrate kind of the utility of in integrating spatial and simulation-based inference to understand complex speciation histories, but also contribute to this growing body of evidence that species diversity on Madagascar is vastly underestimated. So by moving across scales of biodiversity from communities of species that interact to assemblage of species, and lastly, population genetic level divergence and the formation of new species, we sort of synthesized a big picture of what the most important players have been that generated the beautiful and unique biota of Madagascar. So, you know, this place where populations can diverge over short time scales, communities can assemble and turn over on larger time scales. And this is all taking place in the context of these much deeper inland uh, island com colonization and adaptation events. So, you know, I hope that not only is this useful for understanding reptile and amphibian diversity on the island, but also kind of expanding this out to understand how other vertebrate tacks on the island have diversified. So with that, I want to thank all the other collaborators, funding agencies, uh, field team that have been this integral part of supporting and making this research possible. Um, and you know, I, I wanna put up my contact info here, but I also wanna use the last couple of minutes to really quick talk about my new study system that I'm really excited about. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm in the Leo lab, which is a really new lab at the University of Lethbridge. And so I moved from, from working on snakes with a 1.5 gig genome to working now on long-toed salamanders, which have an estimated 2.5, uh, 25.5 gigabase genome. So much, much larger working on long-toed salamanders, which have this pretty big distribution in, in Western North America and Canada. Um, but more specifically, one thing that I'm really interested in and the lab is really interested in is understanding differences between populations that occur at low elevation, uh, habitats as well as high elevation habitats. So an example of one of these low elevation habitats is pictured here. Um, although this looks very scenic, it was actually kind of like shoulder height uh, <laughs> sage grass that we had to hack through. And it's actually on the side of the road right in Castle Provincial Park at low elevation. Um, and some of our sites are actually at very high elevation. So this is where I just came back from this weekend sampling salamanders at this high elevation site um, remote site where there's actually fish stocking and you know that fish stocking has resulted in populations that have become permanent and usually these fish populations have extirpated the salamanders however at some of these high elevation habitats the salamander populations have persisted and actually co-occur so we were finding salamanders uh, little salamanders that were right up against fish fry that were almost about the same size and so one thing that we're interested in is understanding you know why we see these very discrete differences between high and low elevation populations. And yet these two populations obviously exchange enough genetic information to um, be, be more similar than species that are across different ecological gradients at the same elevations within other subspecies. And so we do see uh, very discrete developmental 
uh, the onset of developmental timing being different between these populations. And we also see kind of this differential survival rate in the presence of fish in these two populations as well. So these are kind of some of the things that we're interested in using genome wide sampling. And hopefully, you know, one day we're some collaborators are working on a whole genome sequence for the salamander as well. Um, and being able to really understand those adaptive differences between these populations, but also understanding why these populations don't differentiate despite all of these difference differences, um, you know, and coupling that with things like uh, morphological differences and color pattern differences within these populations. So this is just an example of a very uncolored individual long toed salamander here, um, as well as other species level traits. And I have to say that I do not mind the high elevation sites that some of these uh, salamanders have have selected as their habitat because they're really fantastic to to sample from. So I'm really excited about um, some of the new stuff coming up with this project as well. Oh, sorry, that is that is the last, <laughs> that is the end of, the, I just wanted to mention really quick kind of the new stuff that I'm working on. And this is a Zonosaurus <laughs> for my last slide. So I'll just whip really quick back to my contact slide if anyone's interested in, in following up on any of that with me. Um, yeah, Ooh. Went a little too far. Yeah, so if, if anyone has, I guess, any questions, I'd be happy to chat about them. Perhaps we can unmute and uh, and give an actual auditory. <laughs> hey. Wow! Hey. Uh, it's like we're all in person. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Questions for Ariana. Great. <laughs> I have a general question, um, which is, first of all, I'm so impressed with the amount of data that you've collected. What a cool set of data to play around with. Um, I'm curious to hear the background on who, who thought about co collecting these data and how is it going? Do you have the full, you said 64 sites for over 100 species or something? Oh, uh, for, for which part? <laughs> The um, whole genome sequence. Oh, so the whole genome. Um, so the other part was genome-wide sampling. So that that's uh, just uh, rad, rad data. But yeah, still, for like the sixty-four population. Yeah, yeah. It, it was really cool. The way this really. So that part specifically compared to the whole genome part really kind of evolved. That when I came there, you know. Frank had already, you know, we had this big plan of, of looking at diversification across all the pseudoxyrophenes. And I, I kind of mentioned that there because that actually finished long before I had started even writing my proposal. Just the timing of things um, didn't work out for that. But we had like all of these samples. And I kind of, at that time I had like Sanger data and I was kind of looking at all of them being like, oh, maybe I'll do these two together. Or like, and then I started kind of like adding things in. And that's when I had that moment where I was like, what if I looked at every species that I like on Madagascar? And then I was like going through the field guide and I was like, Europlatus, like chameleons, like it was really cool. Um, but then for, for the snake phylogeography, yeah, we just had all these really great samples and kind of started looking at them and realizing that it, actually was enough to be able to ask these types of questions if I treated them as independent populations. So a lot of times um, I wouldn't be able to look at all of those the way I did for that last part because I would never be able to rule out IBD across some of the, the sampling. But when we're treating them as these independent populations and just asking questions explicitly about their historical demography, just with population contraction and expansion, then it kind of works out and it allows you to deal with things that maybe don't have that perfect spatial sampling across space, like I would need if I was looking at co-divergence. And that's why those, those other players are kind of in the end. So we added in a bunch more sampling for those to fill in those sampling gaps because we knew that they were common. And if we went back, we would be able to get them. Um, so that's kind of, that's sort of how the big plan for all of that worked out. And it was right near the time when I was leaving that there are some really sweet deals getting these uh, phased whole genome sequences done. And Frank was like, why don't we just do a Langaha? That would be so crazy. And we were like, that'd be so crazy. And we're like, we should, we should actually do that though. <laughs> so it was started with just a handful of these like high coverage genomes. Um, and so that data, we only really got back right before I left. So it wasn't a part of my dissertation, but now uh, a current student that's working with Frank there got a like whole, uh, low coverage whole genomes for almost every single species in the entire subfamily. So she's doing a bunch of diversification stuff with that and looking at reticulation. And then we also want to kind of add that in to like do the whole genome co-expansion stuff that I'm interested in. 
That is so neat. Yeah. Ariana, were you able to do, so is that all 10X genomics uh, genomes or? So the ones that are phased are 10X genomics, yeah. That was like uh, five. I don't think, I don't know if I mentioned it was explicitly five, but basically what happened is we sent them out uh, and the coverage wasn't good enough. And so then we had to add in some, some additional sequencing to get that 60X coverage. Cause it was kind of like, if it's at 30, but we need it to be high coverage, it's kind of like not filling that space. So that way we have something really solid for the low coverage stuff to be mapped to. Yeah, which is, yeah. And I think I don't, I'm not like as clued into that because it's not really my project, but I know, I think they had a pretty good deal for getting those low coverage ones, but I'm not hundred percent sure like kind of how much it was or, or, or what the deal was, if it was like an aim and age specific thing. Yep. Other questions for Ariana? I could ask a question. That was a great yeah. talk and really uh, fun to see all that data. Um, I guess I, I wanted to ask a more technical question just because you have experience with both sort of looking at the ABC methods and machine learning and things like that. In terms of discerning what's going on with these herbs, do you have any recommendations about what approaches seem to be really good? Um, yeah, like I, I spent a lot, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that I like didn't go back to ABC and it's not because like, as I move forward and, and all my future plans are kind of not going back to that. And it's simply because, um, I will say this, like using some of the machine learning approaches, I looked at a couple of different ones, like gradient boost and like things like that. And some certainly perform better. I think it's just, it totally freaks me out how careful you have to be about looking at it because some of the estimates look great and all the confidence intervals are really tight, but it's really like, you know, I know everyone says this, but it, it's a lot more of the garbage in garbage out. So I think you can, you have to fine tune so much more and it, it looks so good that you want to not do that, but it's a really important part of it. But because of that, I really think that there's a lot of power there to kind of like do a, a more Lego style building block and kind of get closer to these things. So for that last part, for my uh, demographic inference, even for just uh, looking at the different models of divergence across all the different species and, and gene flow, I also use kind of like a similar DIY simulation regression approach um, using some of those different machine learning algorithms. But I do still really, uh, I think ABC is also great. It makes a lot more sense to me because I feel a little more like I have less of that playing tuning around to do. So I will say for the first part, if that's something you're interested in, either for co-divergence or for, um, I, I failed to mention this and I feel bad about that, but um, the program that I use is called Pipe Master. And so that works for, you know, Sanger or RAD data. And it's, it's an R package that was built by our postdoc in the lab. And then for the other parts, the PTA stuff, it's definitely on GitHub, um, but it's, it's not all the way done yet, but it's like usable if, if you're interested. There's just some parts where I'm like, hmm, so, like, I didn't show all of it. I don't even think I have those slides in here still, but some of the, you know, some of the cross validation for some of the parameters, it's a little like fuzzy still. Whereas like the ones that I talked about are the ones that were really good. So like divergence time and migration was like very clear. And some of the other ones were like, they still need some work. Totally understandable. <laughs> yeah, so like I was like, oh, I won't talk about these because I don't think they're, <laughs> they're right yet. It needs a little bit more, more fine tuning. I kind of have a follow-up question oh. um, and don't take this the wrong way because I know that this question applies to like everything that I'm doing. <laughs> so I'm not, it's not, don't take yeah. it as a critique. I'm just curious um, if you think that like, for example, those ABC methods are how dependent they might be on knowing what the generation times are for your, for your focal groups. Cause it seems like, you know, you could wind up with a, with a pretty big difference in the divergence timing. If, yeah. And how you're able to deal with that, or if you're able to deal with that on a group of snakes or other and organ, other organisms that are probably not that well known from the standpoint of their ecology. Yeah. So something, I mean, when I first first started working on this group, I remember like running like IMA on like one of the species, and I like found some guy that was breeding Madagascarovis, and I was like, how long do you think it takes them to like? I was going like crazy. It used to drive me nuts trying to figure out how to do, and I honestly do stuff like that. And then I kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, yeah, we're like, we're so far from knowing that about a lot of these species. And, and usually what I do it to make myself feel better about it is just drawing from like a distribution for that, uh, that is kind of centered on a mean 
that's for the like the a lapid one and then kind of setting those conference intervals or the the bounds around that to encompass all the other squamate kind of mutation rates and then the same thing for sort of generation time something that's makes sense and then you know is bounded by something that's realistic for herps so that i'm not heavily biasing it in that way but at the same time that's why when i think of these you know shared divergence events like i still believe that they're shared i just don't know if they're shared at the time that i'm saying that they are and you know that's kind of the tricky part and so i also did a bunch of stuff with fast sim call and of course like you know dates aren't the same <laughs> and so that's that's something that's why this isn't out yet i'm kind of trying to figure out how to deal with that which is something i think we probably all deal with <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Or people just, you know, they sweep it under the carpet because it's difficult because it's almost unsolvable for some vocal groups. Yeah, I guess I was thinking when you were first speaking about the about the non-matching um, chronologies of the mm -hmm. divergence events, it was like, oh, maybe this is because they have different divergence, you know, they, they have different generation times. And then when you were reporting that you did have like really close uh, convergence with, within that that tropical uh, zone, it's like, wow, that's kind of the opposite of what I might have been hoping for if my little pet explanation mm -hmm. because you can imagine that things that are things that are living in yeah. a in a more you know temperate zone on the island might actually have a more discrete sort of reproductive period whereas those tropical yeah. things might be breeding all the time right yeah and it's hard because like like saying like i did a bunch of stuff with traits but i felt like like i felt more comfortable moving to the snakes and knowing that at least it's more likely that the things i'm assuming about them were shared like i wonder if it's just like the likelihood of them sharing a really similar generation time was better than the idea of like me guessing at a plesidon, you know, or not a plesidon, but like some of them like Mataskinkus, like I knew like snakes were the same and, you know, some frogs had some stuff reported in the literature and I used what I could, but a lot of times I was kind of like, you know, like, like there was a couple of like tortoises and I was like, I don't know what their generation time is, you know, and I, I pulled stuff from just <laughs> yeah. groups that were related to these groups, but people really don't know for a lot of them. And it could be like 11, like it could be something crazy and that'll totally shift them and put them in the asynchronous bucket right off the bat. And that's the problem is like the second you bias anything, it's asynchronous. So like I trust more the synchronous responses, but when I get asynchronous, I'm just like not 100% confident that it's not something that we just don't understand about the organisms. So that's yeah. the, you know, whenever you go to include all the species, the, you know less about all of them, but then when you zone in too far, then you miss some of the patterns. So that's, that's, that's where I fluctuate on this 100%. Hey, Ariana, how does diet fit into this? I mean, if some snakes are, say, dependent on eating mammals, herps, or amphibia, mm -hmm. I would think they would be differentially influenced by how the prey are influenced by the climate or what yeah. you're looking at a hundred percent so that is like exactly one of the one of the explanations for when we do see those asynchronous responses is if you have your prey kind of actually expand and then you're tracking that prey and you expand you're going to have this delayed response and that's going to bin you as asynchronous so it's not necessarily that you're not responding to kind of an indirect way to a climate change event but you know, you're gonna end up looking like this kind of asynchronous thing due to these differences in traits. So kind of one of the explanations is differences in traits, differences in kind of abiotic interaction or biotic interactions versus this idea that the event was so strong, it just trumps all these other possible explanations for, for how species could differ. Do but yeah, know, that's, that's definitely- <laughs> Do you know much about the diets of these snakes? Um, we don't know much, to be honest. I mean, there there have been some times where we were sampling and I was like, oh man, these eat skinks. That's really crazy. I wouldn't have expected that. Um, there is certainly a little bit of literature on the diet of these snakes. Um, and I know uh, Philip Skipwith, who's now in Kentucky, he has done a lot of work with their ecomorphology and kind of linking that to diet and understanding how, you know, how those kind of patterns relate. And so I think we'll know more in the future, but at the time that I was doing this study, I definitely had to kind of, you know, pare down my ability to understand the influence of these different traits on those responses, especially something like diet, which is like the thing that I feel like drives so many snake patterns. So I really hated not having that. <laughs> okay.
Ariana, hi. A hi. really impressive and engaging talk. Uh, I'm here in California, so that was like National Geographic level with these <laughs> pine cone nose snakes. Um, although I, I'm a salamander person myself, so I love mm -hmm. that you're uh, pivoted to North American salamanders. You talked about uh, sampling some of the high elevation lakes. Mm -hmm. Were you finding animals uh, in breeding ponds and little peripheral small ditches and things like that as well? Um, so um, right now what we have is, is those like peripheral ditches and we even have potentially evidence that some of the ATV ditches, like the salamanders may, when they get deep enough, they'll actually use these too. But my experiences in finding them in the really, really peripheral, peripheral small ditches and stuff like that is more at the lower elevations um a lot of our high elevation sites we have much fewer high elevation sites because these are the places where things were stocked with fish and um some of them just like aren't there anymore and so for our higher elevation stuff for example the site i just came back from we didn't find anything in the whole lake and it was actually just in the outflow like the very close outflow that we were finding larva and i'll be honest like these larvae will probably overwinter like i don't think that they were you know, they were quite big and they were like the same size as the fry. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on with the impact of fish stocking and then the salamander responses. And so our first pass is just going to be like genetic diversity. Can we see anything going on here? Because all the previous work with the high and low elevation stuff was in Montana and it was microsat. So first I want to see if these like differences are really detectable again in our populations at the high and low elevations. Um, and then I want to see, you know, how much connectivity there actually is between these kind of different subsets. But yeah, I wasn't finding them at high elevations in ditches, but I wasn't there through the whole field season. So it's, it is possible that, that that was present as well. Yeah, I was wondering if that's helping them persist too. Mm -hmm. that they're, they're yeah. Very, yeah. Yeah, like you have this opportunity to get away from the fish for a little bit. I was just surprised that these large larvae were there because I was thinking you're the same size as these fry now, but you weren't before. So how are you surviving here? And they have really different behavior when there are fish, they're always under rocks and it's harder to find them. Whereas like if it's a non-fish uh, pond, you know, they'll be up near the surface and it's, it's pretty distinct. Yeah. Well, good luck. I'm excited to hear about it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to, to get the data back. <laughs> so do we have more questions for Ariana? Nobody else has a question that's that's specific to the uh, the content of the talk. I have a question that I bet a number of people are wondering about. Do you have a? I'll go ahead and ask it. So, do you have a do you have a theory on what Langaha is doing with that crazy uh, nasal protuberance? So, um, Andrew <laughs> Durso has a really great blog post about it that I honestly like. I feel like I've read it four different times, and I'm just like, man, that's so crazy. I'm gonna read that blog post again. That's nuts because he's got really great uh, literature, kind of citing what we do know about it. And I've talked to a couple of different morphologists, and what I do know is that Skip was doing um, when he was staining. I think he actually did do like an actual soft CT scan. Uh, scan of the snakes and it's not like something crazy like with the anolis where it's innervated and it's like moving on its own and you know if you touch them it's like it's kind of cartilagey um the thing that just seems crazy to me is that you have you know distinct differences in males and females yeah. but then they both still have this appendage so it's got to have like a camouflage level and then when they're babies it's sort of like folded over their face and it doesn't pop out until later <laughs> um and they, they sort of like hang from the trees like very limp like they look exactly like a vine so i understand the idea of camouflage like it clearly works really well but they also look like a vine if they didn't have it and the crazy thing is like these you know i think these snakes are actually really common but i think they're at higher levels of canopy and so you just don't see them that much it's not that they're not abundant it's just that they're not in our range of view so they seem rare and then there's two other species in the, the Langaha genus, and they also have sexual dimorphism that's completely different than the nasal ones of the, the Madagascar opus. Like it's more of like a cone shape and the males and females are different. Um, and so there's very little information on that because these ones are, I think, super rare. Like those you don't find everywhere, um, pseudo and Aludae. Um, so yeah, my I guess it's like some mix between camouflage, but also like camouflage isn't enough of an explanation for the differences in the males and the females. Is there, is there, has anybody looked to see if it's like particularly innervated with, you know, like some sort of, you know, 
neurons that might be sensitive to heat or sensitive to something else that mm -hmm. might make that might provide some sort of function other than just camouflage or sexual oh yeah i i was talking to a bit with somebody who does more like histology and they're like the way to really nail this down would probably be doing that type of work and then you know these specimens like everyone's very precious about their langos specimens and and yeah. i was like oh man. i had this like really big moment right after i defended and i was like i feel like i need i want to do that <laughs> but yeah it's, it's definitely out of my wheelhouse you know the something like histology but i think someone should do it because it's really cool and, and it would be like such a cool thing for snakes it'd be like a really big day for snakes for like get them get their name out there for langa <laughs> and the skull just looks normal doesn't have anything uh, there's nothing under there um nope it's just it's there's there, it's totally cartilage that's what skip told me and he didn't see any evidence of like um innervation but in terms of like the actual cross sections no one's ever actually looked at that and then but it's actually um, cartilage because that's something right i mean that's it, yeah it, that's something right Mm -hmm. So that's that's all I know about it. And I know that like in captivity, people have kind of described their behaviors very specifically and in the wild of like kind of just hanging there and doing nothing like 90% of the time. That's like all they do. <laughs> and, you know, when you hold them, they're just kind of like very limp and stiff and, and they're really, really thin little snakes. And they technically have all this, um, you know, they're one of the species that like, you know, it's a little more venomous than the other ones. So you have like a little bit of a burning sensation. Frank got bit by one, but their heads are like this big. Um, but I'm really curious about the other two species because I think it's like just in collections, you might have like of the pseudo eludi and eludi, you might have like two females or like two males. So these like understanding even how sexually dimorphic those ones are, we don't even have the specimens to really do it. You know, the one that we got that is like that single branch in the tree for our, our whole subfamily study, it's like was like a roadkill specimen, you know, on the side of the road. So we don't even really know what part of the habitat it was occupying. So we really don't know a lot about them. But I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I was like, oh man, maybe I should just like be doing that. <laughs> be looking at Langaha's nose, but yeah. Figured out you'll probably get a really high profile paper out of it. Right, like it'll be like a very small amount of work, but people would go nuts for this. Or maybe I'm like biased and thinking that everyone cares about this as much as me. That's why I had to put it in the talk. I was like, it's her group. I actually get to like talk about how crazy this is now. But everyone should go to read Andrew Durso's blog on it because it's really cool. It's like, a, it's a good read. And then I'll, I'll look for your nature paper in two years <laughs> on it. <laughs> Any last minute questions for and Ariana? This makes me kind of think of a previous herp group where people were showing the uh, like the knoll with the proboscis yeah. on it that lives up in the canopy. I mean, if it's not camouflage or some sort of thing about living in the canopy, that's a really strange coincidence. Yeah, it definitely is. And then they don't even really have it right away when they're babies because it's kind of folded over. So it's not like they have instantaneous camouflage because of it. So it's kind of, you know, it's not super clear um yeah i don't yeah i don't know in virtually I mean, all the iguanian lizards that have these proboscis it's a sexually dimorphic character where the males have it and the females don't including in the anolis so this is, that's why the snake is weird right that it's yeah. males and females but different yeah and it makes me wonder like yeah why like i don't i can't think of anything where like they something is both for camouflage but also it's completely sexually dimorphic and present in both in both males and females i have i have no idea and I, sorry go ahead no i just i don't think there's even any other species of snakes that have like sexual dimorphism with like or ornamentation it's usually just like body size and, and you know gape size and stuff i don't know i could be wrong i, I don't think there is though Ariana, right, did, did you say it's wobbly on their nose even it's not that it's like wobbly it's just like you can like you know <laughs> not that I did this a bunch of them, but you can you can like bend it. It's just it's not like uh, very structured. <laughs> this really makes me think that we could have a very fun herp group where we each bring our favorite understudied herp and yeah. talk about how weird it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I like think about Langaha all the time. <laughs> that is so cool. I didn't know about them. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm also really curious, like, if it, if my theory about them being actually really abundant, but just in the high canopy, we still don't know that either. And and every time we would find them, it would be during the dry season. So it made me think, like, you know, you're only coming down when it's super dry to get water, versus like never coming down. You know, and and the times I would find them, it would be kind of like at head height in the canopy at night, kind of like hanging out, draped in a bush. Um, 
I think a lot of the lizards are up in the canopy and come down and sleep lower at night. You are you or they're encountered when they're low. I mean, are these snakes catatonic like like the lizards are? Most of the lizards with those with the proboscis are like these chameleon like slow walkers. Yeah, they're not super fast. Um, every time I've been kind of photographing them, they're sort of just like sitting there. Um, it's hard to even get them to like posture in a way that's not sad because they really do this like <laughs> draping thing with their head that kind of like hangs down and it looks so, and then as you're going through the forest at night, you look at every vine, you're like, man, every one of these vines could be a langaha because they look just like the vines that kind of drape through the dry deciduous forest. And they have a really wide, like from the sampling we have, of all my sampling, like I, I insisted on including them, but they really had the worst sampling because it's like they're all the way from the north into the south and it, it's impossible to tell if it's like IBD or two different actual species like genetically they're really different but I, I don't know unless we had more. Um, so like that, that could be a really wide distribution that's pretty crazy when everyone considers them to be like quite rare, you know, I don't think that they actually are. At least they're rare for us to see but. I don't know, I really, li <laughs> really like them. They're super cool. And I got to catch, like, all I wanted was to catch both of the different, um, like the male and the female. And I finally, by the third season, I, I finally got to catch a female. So I got to see both of them. So I thought that was really cool. Pretty, cool. pretty neat snakes. <laughs> yeah, I hope, some, I hope someone figures it out because it's, it's pretty neat. Oh, it's gotta be you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. Yeah, I'm gonna come. I keep coming back to it all the time. Then I'm like, what am I doing? Astrology <laughs> is easy and very useful. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you do nerve staining. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's my pet theory. I think that's a great. Yeah. I th I think yeah. I think that's a great great idea. There's yeah. There's a lot of a lot of unknowns there. And there's a lot of other weird species too. I didn't even get to talk about, but that one is my favorite. And everyone's like, oh, Ariana, now that you work on salamanders, are you going to start all of your talks and talk about how salamanders are your favorite species on earth? Because that's like what you did for all the snake talks. I was like, I can't because everyone's seen me <laughs> saying the other stuff, but I, you know, I'm quite fond of the salamanders too. You can change. People can change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the People first thing... <laughs> Frank was like, you can't go to Alberta. There aren't even any snakes there. And then I, I like Googled the university and there's just like a giant rattlesnake warning sign in front of like everything there because people are like really freaked out by the rattlesnakes here. So yeah. So that makes it okay to come to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no more um, questions for Ariana, I guess we can thank her again and then uh, and then I guess bring her group to a close. Thank you so much, Ariana. The talk was thank awesome. You. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. It was really great chatting. Great talk. <laughs> thank you so much. Beautiful photographs. Awesome. Yeah, this is fun seeing everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Ariana. Oh, no problem. All right. Take Thanks. Care. Bye. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you.